Please welcome David Rubin, Chief Brand and Communications Officer at the New York Times. He's been named a brand genius by Adweek and one of the 25 most innovative CMOs in the world by Business Insider. He'll be discussing reinvention at scale with moderator Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. Good to see you. Thanks for joining out of your busy schedule in September. My pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having me. joining uh, today. So we first met when you were in the CPG world um, at Unilever. And now here you are in a really prominent role at the New York Times. What were some of the learnings that you had from your days at Unilever? Because I know you were really involved in some really transformational work with Axe and other brands. What were you able to take away from that that you think still applies today? Um, I, you, well, let's see. I mean, first of all, um, I think the foundations of consumer product marketing, of the idea that you need to sort of know what your brand stands for and then have that play through like every one of the P's, isn't that what we try to remember back to my MBA days, um, I think is really important. You know, ever since I left Unilever, my last, I was at Pinterest and here, so I guess it's been about 10, 11 years. Um, the marketing is not the center of the organization. And so being able to apply that thinking that sort of a, a brand strategy can affect everything you're doing and can do that in a way that doesn't jeopardize product quality or uh, independence of editorial in our case um, is uh, is it's been a helpful concept and really starting with a lot of that is starting with what the end user wants. So now you're chief brand and communications officer and obviously the brand in the New York Times it's an iconic brand um, it's a brand that's obviously uh, at the top of everyone's mind when things happen in, in business or obviously culture society um, how have you stewarded the brand how do you look at the brand in New York Times in a world where the entire media landscape is kind of changing around you? Yeah, I mean, we think that what we do is we seek the truth and help people understand the world. Um, for us, that's, a, it, that's about, you know, the seek the truth is sort of the core journalistic, you know, without fear or favor concept that the New York Times has been doing for 173 years. Um, the help people understand the world is really about, you know, all media places are trying to give you information um, we think the difference for us is that we're really going for understanding. And what that's going to mean probably is that you need multiple touch points. You're going to look at a story from multiple angles. We're going to have different formats. You might read an article about it, listen to it at the daily, get it in your inbox from um, uh, the morning newsletter. And so that, that sort of, we sort of don't apologize, a little opposite of what you were talking about up here. We don't apologize for a little bit of that complexity because we think it gives you a higher level of understanding. Right. And obviously for New York Times to continue to thrive moving ahead, you need to be able to connect with younger generations. You know, you being a legacy brand provides so much value when it comes to trust, but in terms of getting younger people in, there's probably some reinvention I would imagine that needs to occur around your core pillars so you become attractive to that. Absolutely. Every, everything yeah. I just talked about is like, if you go back 20 years ago, we had the print product. There were right. no, there were no podcasts. There was no, um, you know, our, our, our journalists actually would be all over the information ecosystem, but they wouldn't be working with us. Yeah. Um, and today they're doing, you know, our video journalism is investigative video journalism is the best in the industry. Our infographics and visuals are the best in the industry. The idea of a newsletter was not something we had. Um, most of our, po many of our podcasts are among the most listened to in the, you know, on Apple and Spotify. Um, the idea that we have a games product. How many people here play New York Times games? Love it, almost every hand just went up. Yes, thanks for the shout out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things were, were things that were not um, part of our, you know, of our offering before. So we're constantly changing that, but what's interesting is the, the underpinning of it all, the, the brand promise, has not changed at right. all. Right, that can't change. And I think That's a right. lot of companies sometimes lose who they are when gravitating towards the next big thing, and then ultimately people don't really know what they stand for. Yeah, you can also talk yourself into a story that, um, look, I think young people's consumption habits are very different, but they're not as different as we make them out to be at conferences like this. You know, like, they still care about the news. In right. fact, if anything, young people care about the world more than they have in the past, and they're worried about it, and they're nervous about it. Um, the fact that they are consuming it on TikTok, 
or on YouTube is kind of inconsequential, to be totally honest. It's just whether you can take what you're offering and offer it to them. YouTube and TikTok wouldn't exist if there wasn't content. Right. And the content comes from what happened in the world, which is where you're... Right. And in, and in the space of information and understanding, if that content's not reliable, it's not going to last real long. And I think that's what happened in the first 15 years of the internet, is people just went after whatever it was would work. And I think we've all realized, most of the country has realized that sort of getting your news from whatever's in your feed is not really going to make you smarter about anything. And so I think people still do that, but they supplement it with looking for other sources. Yeah, for sure. So one strategy in New York Times has really been, you mentioned games, and obviously the passion points surrounding news has been something that New York Times quite successfully has dove into. So uh, the wire cutter is one of your brands. The Athletic uh, was a big acquisition, I believe, yep. that the New York Times made. So how do those passion points and those ancillary brands feed into your overall strategy and why are they so important? So um, when I got to the Times, the strategy was journalism worth paying for. Um, for the last four or so years, it's the essential subscription strategy. It's not a, it's not a pivot, but it's a, a broadening. Um, the idea of the essential subscription strategy is that we're going to be the source for news and information in across people's passion points. And so we only do that in spaces where we feel like a journalistic mindset can make a difference, where that seek the truth and help people understand the world actually will play out, and where the economics allow us to do so. We are mostly a consumer subscription brand, um, although, and although we do have an advertising business and Wirecutter is largely affiliate driven. Um, but if we can make those economics work and our journalistic mindset can make a difference to the quality of the product you get, then we'll think about playing in the space. Yeah. And in terms of the brand architecture, what goes behind the decision when you buy the athletic, just not making it part of your sports or a wire cutter being part of your tech? Like, keeping those brands separate had to be a very conscious decision that you made. Yeah, I mean, we, they are separate and they aren't. All of our standalone brands, as we call them, we want to be brands in their own right and to be part of a whole. So right. we definitely have a single promise. You know, the New York Times goes in front of those names. And it's a single promise about the role that the journalist plays in creating that product um, and the trust, trustworthiness that you can have of what you're getting. Um, that being said, it was just a lot easier to, you know, the athletic ultimately is a local journalism model. Um, you know, it's the team you care about, which usually is geographic, but not always. Um, and, but we're covering that local team better than anywhere else, and then we scale that up. We just didn't have the, you know, we would have to have hired 500 and some journalists right. in order to make that work. We could get there a whole lot faster through an acquisition. Wirecutter today has 120 journalists doing something very specific, which is product reviews and testing. It was just a lot easier to acquire that than it was to build that over a half a decade or whatever it would have taken. Yeah, and when you talk about the athletic, you know, I tell and I've told New York Times the teams I care about, and then I get emails and content around those teams. It's personalized to what I care about. That's right. I would imagine that's a strategy when you talk about a subscription model and making sure that you're continuing to deliver value that you want to make sure that you're giving people what's most important to them. Yes, and. Okay. Um, one of the things, the, the Times' core proposition is that we're going we're gonna to draw your attention to things that matter, and we're going to challenge your thinking. So when we talk to our, our readers, the thing they love about, people who love the Times, the thing they love about it is it made them care about something they didn't know they cared about. It made them think about it differently. So if we only offer you what you already believed, we'd be failing at our job. And so there is, a per there is, and I think there will continue to be, growth in our ability to show you what you care about, but also part of our promise to you, part of what you pay for, is us showing things that you wouldn't have known to ask for. And so we have to figure out the balance of those two things. You know, it's not going to be like a streaming service where you open it up and the only thing you get is the thing that you, you know, that your behavior suggests you want. It's going to be a combination of those things. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're a reader in Australia, you can imagine you might have slightly different interests about how much, you know, core U.S. news content you want to have. Um, and so, you know, you may not care about the weather on the West Coast that much, you know. And so we will be, we have aspects of what we do that will be tailored and aspects of what we do that will be, you know, where everyone will get the same story because that's what you want from us. Right. It's interesting because social media, I would argue, has not done that, where 
it's created echo chambers. Yep, where, absolutely. You know, the, the more you go in one direction, as crazy or, you know, valid as that direction may be, and obviously people have different definitions of what those things are, you just get more and more and more of that. You get more emboldened in the stance, and that's what's created so much polarization that we see right now from political and cultural landscape in the United States. So I guess what are your thoughts what are your thoughts on the role of social media companies in that regard? Obviously, you know, that there's so much of news legislation. Should they be liable what's on their platform? Just curious. What are your yeah, thoughts on that? I don't know if I'm going to take the bait on that question, but I... I it wasn't meant to be bait at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, what I will say is the... Um, I think that, first of all, I think that's true. Uh -huh. I think it's also getting... I think there's a possibility that where, where the ecosystem is going and generative AI and sure. the likely explosion of content is only going to make that more true. Yeah. And we actually think that's an opportunity for quality independent news providers and content providers. Um, you already see it. I mean, I joined eight years ago, eight and a half. We had one and a half million subscribers. Today we have ten, over ten and a half million. So it's absolutely true that people will pay for the news um, and they'll pay for quality news. We think that's only going to get more true as it gets harder and harder to find the content that that people want. Um, and so, like you were talking about, you know, where you saw devices going and how people are going to wear glasses and ask questions. It's only going to be true if the question you ask gets an answer that's reliable. Of course. And at the moment, most of these things don't provide you answers that are reliable. Right. Um, and the more we move to a single answer versus you choosing what answer you want, the more the answer is going to need to be reliable. And I think that's actually, to us, that sounds like opportunity more than more than a, a challenge. Yeah, I mean, you're providing a foundational layer in a world where we're grabbing at things that we don't know. And people are going to go back to, people are going to increasingly seek out what they trust, you know, names that they trust. I actually think you were asking brand loyalty in the, you know, in the, in the digital era. I actually think in our space, we're on the cusp of a return to that brand loyalty because of the, because of the need for reliability. Yeah, I mean, there's no bar anymore for somebody to have an audience. Right. So all those institutional, I guess, checkpoints, if you will, are kind of gone. And now people don't really know. And, and you know, if, when a platform removes verification, like what happened with X, like, you know, we don't really know sometimes if yeah. is this really them or not. And I think then you don't really know what to trust and where things are. That's right. And you don't know where the information came from and the, you know, the labeling and identification of news versus opinion is non-existent. Um, and so I think all of those things lend themselves to, you know, some of the, for lack of a better word, legacy news providers, institutional right. news providers. So you mentioned going from one, mil one million to 10 million in eight years, and that's really stratospheric growth. I mean, growing 10x is like startup type growth. And when you join and when, and, and eight years ago, New York Times was anything but a startup, right? right. It, it had been a long held um, brand in, in our society. How did you do that? Like, what tactics, in your opinion, were most pivotal in executing? Um, so, you know, a few things. Um, first of all, there was a whole period in between that wasn't so successful. <laughs> um, and actually, that's kind of important. You know, yeah. you, know, you know, the internet came, us and others like us chased the idea of scale um, and massive scale, and it's benefited us. At the same time, it's totally destroyed the economics. Um, you know, the, I don't need to tell you all what's happened to the news industry. Um, you know, more jobs in news have been lost in this country than in the coal industry in the last decade. Um, the, and the industry is still struggling. It's never really, you know, scale has not equaled money. Um, and so, and journalism is quite expensive. Uh, um, it, there's really no substitute for human on the ground reporting in terms of the quality that you can get. Um, and so, and the quality of the understanding that's given on the other end. And so, like any expensive human capital business, if you're not growing, you're shrinking, you know? And so, that got all disrupted. 08, 09, the company almost went bankrupt. Um, after the financial collapse, we started to stabilize. A lot of other places chose, they didn't have a choice, and they gutted their newsrooms. The New York Times really tried to hold on to that and got rid of everything else, scaled back from being a conglomerate, sold off the air, the, you know, the private planes and all that kind of stuff, and really focused on the New York Times brand and providing journalism. 
From there, and they put up a paywall in 2011, which was a very gutsy decision that most people thought was a bad one. Yeah. Um, it has made, a, has made all the difference. So that was point one, which was sort of aligning around the scale of the problem, the existential risk, and that becoming a subscription business, a consumer subscription business, was going to be our bet. It still took a while, but that did a lot. So a lot of the lesson is just the need to, you know, modest success is the biggest enemy to change, I think. Yeah, and, and when you run a subscription business, it would seem to me that it allows you to uphold your brand standards even more because you're not solely relying on advertising. Mm -hmm. And I think as much as other publishers might say there isn't a blurring of the line between editor and advertising, if your biggest advertiser is General Motors, are you going to write a scathing review about their latest vehicle if it means that you have to fire half the company if you lose them as after? And, th and I think that's what a lot of publishers that rely solely on advertising have to contend with. I guess, do you, do you think that's helped your ability to uphold your brand standards? Um, for, for sure. Um, look, in an ad business, this will be overstated, but in an ad business, you don't really care if you have 10,000 people reading one article or one person reading 10,000 articles. Right. Right? Um, economically, you don't care. And in a subscription business, you absolutely have a preference. Right? Nobody's paying for a subscription if they read it once. Um, they're only going to pay when they're using it on a regular basis, and it's a big part of their life. It turned us into being a consumer subscription brand. Um, the, what, a, what the strategy of being subscription first allowed was us to come up with some journalism worth paying for. And that became a mantra of it's not just good enough to we provide you with the news, but was it different enough that you should pay for it? Um, and the thing about us, you know, once you're taking the money directly from the reader, it's just a higher standard of what they, you know, where they'll put their eyeballs. Yeah, for um, sure. And that's, uh, it's helpful. Yeah. Interestingly, our ad business is doing better today than it did in, those, in that period. And look, it's because what do advertisers want? Advertisers want to be in places that people care about, that people have a deep relationship with. That they're yeah. highly engaged. That they're highly engaged with, yeah. and that's gonna happen if your quality's better. And being a subscription business has caused us to make sure that that high quality is there and to invent and reinvent the delivery of the journalism, you know, which has always been good, but the delivery of it has what has really changed for us. Right. So what's unique for your role is that most marketers of CPG brands or tech, or you pick the category, in order for them to make their marketing better, they do work with the product team and they try to push the product and mold it in a way so it's more marketable, right? Some of the best products ever don't even need marketing because they're just so good. You're in a position where you really can't do that. But, you know, you, you're saying the opposite, that, that sometimes you're actually pushing parts of the product to consumers that they may not want or don't think they want. So ultimately, given that, what moves, the, how do you move the needle? for the business, because it can't be through the product, what are the things that you're spending your time on to make sure that you're reducing churn, continuing to drive growth in the future? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, media businesses historically don't do a ton of their own marketing. It's always fascinating to me that the places that ask everyone else, tell everyone else that they have to tell what their brand story, don't tell their own. Yeah. Um, and that started to change, because if you look in journalism, you know, it, we're on a decades long decline of trust in the news, right, as an institution. Um, and some of that, it's not entirely because, but some of that is because news is very bad at explaining what it's for. They've just always assumed that because you read it, you'll understand what they're doing. Journalists are relative, have historically been relatively poor at telling what they do, you know? And what we've done is invested in telling that story. You know, I look, I don't know if any of you have seen some of the campaigns we've done, The Truth is Hard or The Truth is Worth It, or um, uh, all of these campaigns I see as product marketing. Ultimately, we're taking the, the news product, sorry, the news product itself and, um, and putting it into a commercial. Now, of course, we're telling that in 30 seconds and it's stylized and it's meant to make you pay attention. Um, but ultimately, it's just how we make the sausage, um, which is, a journalist on the ground fighting against forces that are trying to stop them from uncovering the story and telling it to you. Right. So we mentioned AI earlier, and obviously there's lack of trust, and it's still like obviously a very nascent platform. That being said, you know, 
when I was speaking earlier, I was talking about how Gen Alpha is going to be the first generation to grow up with AI in the household. They're going to be gravitating towards it um, in many use cases that, that the rest of us aren't today. One of those areas might be news. They might go to a chatbot to get their news, and obviously some of the information, or a lot of it, could be from a platform like yours. How do you see kind of the adoption of these tools impacting the consumption of news? Um, look, it, we sort of already talked about it, is yeah. it will depend entirely on the reliability of the answers. Right. And what we feel very comfortable that, like, the news and information in our space doesn't fall out of the sky. Like, we've already seen this in social media. Um, a billion people experiencing something and then reporting on it does not make it easy to get the single answer. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and just following, you know, your friends or whoever you choose to follow also does not get you the answer. Um, and so, uh, particularly if you want to challenge your own thinking and, and those kinds of things, um, or have confidence in your answer. Uh, and so, it will all come down to how the places that build these tools build them and where they get the information from. Um, and if the information's reliable, then it could be the story you told. If the information's not reliable, then they'll be used for things where people don't care about the quality of the information. Yeah, absolutely. So one, I think, commonality that does exist from your time at Unilever through Pinterest, through New York Times, say, is just the importance of storytelling. Yeah. And obviously, the New York Times has built a, a great, iconic business around that. All the brands in this room need to figure out storytelling because a lot of traditional advertising methods are just not as effective these days. So when you think about storytelling in the context of brands and, and creating their own newsrooms, which is a big thing that's thrown around, it's not news in the context of yeah. storytelling, but their version of news, what are some of the things that you found successful throughout your career in terms of the pillars of storytelling? Um, so, you know, first of all, I think we can often, a little like the story we were talking about, um, we can often look at stories as sort of atomic units, and ultimately, it's what's the overall story you want to tell. It goes back to the basics of CPG marketing. Um, what is that relationship with the end user do you want to have? And are you reinforcing that? Otherwise, you're just grabbing an eyeball and entertaining someone, or, um, and they're going to go away and go somewhere else. Um, how do you weave together a single story? Um, most brands are not in the business of getting eyeballs. They're in the business of selling something else, so that garnering of the eyeball has to be has to lead to something right um and even you know while the times is in a content business ultimately if we've gotten your eyeball but haven't made you understand the world it's not going to help any for us you're not going to pay us yeah and so it's about how do those multiple experiences lead to something in that storytelling um not just uh not just telling stories and feeling good about, you know, the, the volume metrics. Sure. And I think, you know, to wrap up, I think the multimodal approach the New York Times has done, yeah. it, to me, is something that is a hook. I mean, for me at least, like the iPad app and the way that you scroll down and the, just the highly visual element, more immersive form factor is something that I think is really, it, it's top notch, right? And I think brands sometimes have a hard time communicating a core story into a variety of different mediums in a way that's really gripping. That's right, and it, you take the, I mean, this is obviously news, not marketing, but like, look at the debate, right? You could wake up in the morning, first of all, you could follow the debate from us with journalists giving you live, you know, thoughts on what's happening. You wake up in the morning and you could open the homepage and you could get the takeaway of what people are saying and what's been happening. You could get opinion thoughts on what this all means. You could listen to the daily and get a take on, on, on what happened. You got the morning newsletter that gave, you, that gave you thoughts on what it all meant. All of these pieces come together to give you a, a rich experience, and I think no matter what your brand is, it's that same kind of thing. Each, none of those things were doing, it wasn't just how do I tell one story in different formats, it was how does engaging with all of these, I could do any of them alone and I'd learn something, I could do them all together and I'd learn a lot more. Yeah, I think that's something that you've proven to do successfully throughout your career, especially during times. I'm a big fan of you and all the work you're doing. Thank you so much for spending time. Thank with you. Us Thanks today. for having Thank us. Thank you, David. Thank you all. David Rubin, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.